welcome to another episode of Get Tech Smart Global Explosion. I am your host, Flo Nicholas, tech startup founder of Cheap Cheap, as well as director, producer, and host of a local TV show called Get Tech Smart. So I'm traveling around the world featuring minorities who are just really slaying it when it comes into the tech industry, putting a spotlight on what I'm calling the underdog in tech. So today I'm really excited uh, to have Malobi Achake here to talk to me. Malobi, welcome. Thank you so much, Flo. And let's just say you are killing it. I mean, it's so amazing. All the awesome things you've been up to over the past year. It's just been amazing watching you. Thank you so much for having well, me. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So you and I have a similar background. You know, you're a lawyer. You've pivoted into tech. So let's start off by talking about your journey into tech. Yeah, no, absolutely. So yes, I'm a lawyer. I actually have a British law degree. And oh, wow. then I went to, uh, you know, law school in Minnesota to get my JD um, in the mid 2000s. I'm probably aging myself here. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so, um, you know, graduated with my JD um, and practiced for a little bit in Minnesota, um, but ultimately just sort of got to the point where I felt like the business world was calling me, the corporate world was calling me. Um, I was craving this change. Um and I wasn't really sure or, you know, you're going to see a pattern here once I talk about my pivot to tech as well. I mean, to owning my own business. Um, I wasn't really sure. I didn't have like a very, you know, specific vision of what it needed to be. I just knew that I wanted to try something outside of legal practice. Right. And I felt like it needed to be in a large corporate environment. Yeah. And so um, I made that pivot. Yeah. So what were you doing when you made the pivot into tech? Yeah. So I actually worked at a legal tech organization. Um, and so this uh, organization is an industry leader for, um, you know, legal technology. Um, and we had like a variety of full spectrum of products that we would deliver to our clients who were attorneys, um, whether attorneys in, you know, uh, private legal practice or in the corporate environment. So general counsels, et cetera. Yeah. So um, the roles, I mean, I was there for a very long time, over 10 years. Um, and during that time, I really worked in a variety of roles. So I was in, um, you know, business development. I was in cost user experience, customer experience. I was also in operations, obviously leadership role. Um, and most importantly, I was very involved in the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts of the organization. Yeah, that's fantastic. But you've now kind of done from legal tech and you now are doing a different type of tech. So let's get started <laughs> into digging a little deeper on your tech company and what you're working on right now that actually aligns with my platform. Yeah, no, absolutely. I am an incredibly proud founder uh, of a tech startup called DEI Directive. So um, as you know, DEI is industry term for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and essentially what we do is help human resources and diversity, equity, and inclusion professionals uh, with giving them access, real-time and comprehensive access to the data they need to make quicker, better decisions. And when they're able to make better decisions, then the initiatives and their efforts are likely to have impact within the organization. And that impact can actually be sustained in the long run. Um, so that sounds like a mouthful, uh, but to kind of give you an idea of what the current status quo is, a lot of organizations, especially when you're looking in the small to medium range, but you will be shocked, even like really large, well-known organizations really struggle yeah. to um, implement or utilize data in DEI management. Uh, there was a study from a couple of years ago that actually showed an astonishing number for that, only about 35% of organizations wow. utilize data. I know, very shocking. Yeah. And what's even more shocking is when you dig into that number, um, of those 35%, most of those organizations are tracking this information manually. Manually, wow. you heard that right. So <laughs> we mean express Excel spreadsheets, if you're lucky. Uh, in some, it might be in a Word document or other formats. Um, and if you think about that in the context of, you know, what we see happening in the workplace over the last two years with great resignation, the information in my spreadsheet from six months ago 
it's pretty much not really that relevant, right? There's so yeah. much like movement and change within an organization. Um, and so if you are chief diversity officer or chief human resource officer or director of human resources or whatever you may have, and you have this mandate to operationalize and optimize DEI within your organization, and you ha don't have data to do that, or you're using stale data, you can see where that connection is broken, right? Where right. you're working towards something and you're likely to not get the impacts that you want. Um, the second piece of it is of that 35%, most people are actually tracking uh, or collecting data on a very shallow level. Um, and so what I mean by that is if you think about uh, diversity, it's a beautiful thing. There are so many dimensions to it, right? It's not just gender. It's not just race and ethnicity. There's a lot more to it. But that's typically where most organizations stop. Um, and so that means that, you know, when you're rolling out initiatives, you might be able to roll out something that's pretty much on the nose for, you know, gender parity within your organization, but you're going to miss the mark when it comes to other right. areas. And I think part of the thing is having that data on, you know, uh, software versus, you know, manually on, um, you know, Excel spreadsheets uh, mm -hmm. is you're able to build reports quickly, right? That's mm -hmm. number one. Yes. And then the yeah. other, number two, is there any ability for like predictive analysis uh, with this um, software? Um, yeah. So what our software does um, is, like you said, you know, really having that real time access. That's important. Um, having that quick and easy access. That's important. Um, but a huge part of what it does is really help you diagnose the status quo at your organization. So to better assess what your organization's DEI health is. So what I mean by that is, you know, there are some organizations that when you look at where they are um, within any particular demographic spectrum, uh, so let's say, let's talk specifically about gender, um, you might find that, okay, their gender balance is actually pretty close to maybe what it is for the country in general. But once you start digging into that, right, uh, uh, let's say by hierarchy within the organization, you start seeing that there's actually a tendency for uh, women to lose ground each rung up that organizational ladder. Wow. Um, and so what that means is when you're looking at the demographic composition, because I'm going with genderistic with that, uh, along gender lines at the entry level, and then you compare that to what you see at the C-suite level, there is significant disparity. So that's really important information for the person that has the mandate within the organization, usually the HR personnel or the DEI professional. Um, it's really important information for them to know because in that specific example, it might be that we're not necessarily having a hard time attracting these people to our organization. The majority of the problem happens once they get here. So what is happening within our organization? What's our culture? What's our performance management uh, you know, protocol? How are we managing and engaging with these professionals that is causing them to not advance. Um, and that, and now you can start to explore that and come up with very specific, um, you know, uh, initiatives, very specific right. strategies to target and improve upon that. Yeah. So what's the, um, I guess if the person uses the software, do you provide any type of roadmap uh, to say, okay, listen, here's where you are, you're a C. Mm -hmm. And here's how you can get to an A. So yeah. what, what does the service entail? So absolutely, yes. Um, and so, yes, um, that is included. Um, so being able to actually assess your status quo and give you a sense of, 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 of where you are as an organization, uh, but also give you a sense of when you benchmark against your industry, you know, a regional and, and national numbers to give you a sense of, of where you are, because that external context uh, is really important in giving you a more fuller picture. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that, you know, customers are able to do is to be able to essentially set a goal for themselves and then monitor progress against those goals, right? Um, so, so that's also, you know, part of the things that they are able to do. In addition to that, one of the things that we really didn't set out to do this, but, you know, through, we did a ton of market research talking to HR and chief diversity officers. Um, through the, that research, we heard loud and clear that, you know, training and, you know, sparking conversation and dialogue within the organization and raising overall DEI awareness is one of the main things they spend their time doing, figuring out. And so what we did in response to that was also created a very um, highly 
interactive, you know, uh, training modules that these personnel can then disseminate to the workforce at, you know, at whatever rates they choose. Right. And why now more than ever do you think uh, DEI directive uh, is is really needed right now, especially in the tech sector? Yeah. So I mean, for me, I um, I feel like DEI is just really important. Um, it's important for a lot of reasons. Obviously, my specific angle or the DEI directive angle is really the data metrics and accountability angle, right? Because DEI, I know it's at the tip of everybody's tongue. It's kind of become a household term right. um, over the last you know, two, three years. But the truth is DEI work has been around for decades, right? Especially since like the 1960s. Um, so really, um, you know, so I think some of the things wh why it's resonating, obviously with the pandemic, um, we saw a lot of change happen in the workplace, you know, with the pandemic. Uh, we all all had time to really be introspective and really, you know, make a more intentional choice about the kind of life, work-life balance type of work experience that we want. Um, and then we obviously cannot ignore the murder of George Floyd. Uh, that was a huge, um, you know, sort of like moment um, as far as really sparking or pushing organizations into action. Um, so so I, I think those two things have really played a role. Yeah. But beyond that, though, I think, you know, one of the really... Uh, important factors um, that, you know, is talked about, um, I think not nearly as much as it should, um, is the fact uh, that having a DEI healthy organization is great for business, right? Yeah. So I'm going to kind of lay out what I mean by that. Um, so when you are looking at, you know, an organization with DEI health, there's been a ton of research from really remarkable um reputable organizations like McKenzie and Company Deloitte um, that really shows that when an organization um, is, you know, in the top quartile, for example, this particular McKenzie study shows that organization in the top quartile for race um, and cultural diversity actually outperformed those in the bottom quartile by 36 percent. Wow. OK, that's so that's, yeah, 36 percent in, you know, revenue. Now, think about it. One percent is not two dollars. Right. Right. Um, I mean, one percent um, is millions of dollars. So 36 percent, that's pretty significant. And especially in today's really competitive world every percentage counts. So exactly. if you're a leader, this matters to you. Um, and that number, by the way, if we talk about gender uh, balance, so organizations in top quartile for gender balance, that number was 25% compared to those in the bottom quartile. So whichever way you slice and dice it, diversity yeah. obviously brings a lot to the table. Yeah, and um, I love everything that you are doing in this diversity sector. I think uh, Every company should be using um, your software. That's just my opinion. Or some <laughs> sort of software that they can measure the metrics. I think, yeah. you know, not having metrics to take a look at. Uh, and right now, especially when there's so much tech uh, software available, uh, is unacceptable at this point. So thank you so much for joining me today on this episode. Uh, look out for DE Directive. Uh, they are making DEI initiatives a lot easier. Thank you again, Malobi, for being here with me. And to everyone else, thank you for watching another episode of Get Tech Smart Global Explosion for my LinkedIn Accelerator uh, program in technology and innovation. Stay tuned for more.